You're listening to The Business Marketing Show, episode number 63. You can find us at businessmarketingshow.com on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. Hi, it's Ed K. Smith here. Thank you for listening to the Business Marketing Show. We have a special guest on the show today, Maria Doyle from mariadoyle.com. Now, Maria helps clients who are passionate about what they do to design, deliver, and package their information to create a high-quality learning journey so they can deliver a five-star course or workshop or presentation uh, to their audience. So we're going to be having a chat to Maria about um, what she does and how she helps people. And uh, yeah, it should be a, a great session. And we also have, of course, the co-host of the Business Marketing Show, Mr. Brendan Tully from the Search Engine Shop. How are you, Brendan? I'm good. He's good. So how did we meet, Maria? We were on a panel together. What was the name of that panel? Well, we were on a panel called, um, I can't even remember the name of it now, but the essence of it was the truth telling behind uh, getting your content online. Um, one of my clients, Lacey Filipich, who has just launched The Money School, um, she and I spent three or four months together getting her content out of her head and into an online course. And we, it, during that process, she realised how much nonsense there was floating around in the online world about how quick and easy it was to make a passive income from your knowledge and getting it into an online course and you'll be sitting in coladas on a beach in Chiang Mai in no time, just like Brendan. Hey, no, I'm joking. no beach in Chiang Mai. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Well, that's right. You're in the mountains. Sorry. I normally say to be, uh, sipping pina coladas on a beach in Thailand, but I thought I'd change it. That fail. Anyway, um, yeah, so we just, we realised that, I mean, we're both real tr- uh, truth tellers when it comes to the complexity of, um, I guess, the job at hand when you're trying to get your content into an online course. And we decided to get a panel together of people who actually tell the truth around these things. So we got someone in marketing and someone in online, you know, sort of cluey around the online space and how to get your content online quickly and, and efficiently. We had a whole bunch of um, experts who do this stuff for a living and we're there to tell you that, no, it won't take you five seconds to put something up that's quality. You can put something up in five seconds if you want it to be quite straightforward, very simple um, not particularly in depth or complex, but if you do want to put together something that's quality, then it does take some time. So that was what we were doing. We were just getting together, and um, we got a—I think there was about fifty or sixty people in the room um, yeah, that day. Yeah, that's about right. Yep. And just really good conversations around. Um, because if anyone, anyone on, on in the online space thinking of getting into the online space, I'm sure you're assaulted on a daily basis of people um, who are promising to help you make seven hundred and fifty thousand a month in your first month of, ca- of coaching. Um, while you live on your 84th floor of your Manhattan apartment. Um, <laughs> and I guess there's just there's a lot more truth behind the behind the scenes than, than what a lot of people will have you believe. So that was the point of us getting together. We um, uh, Ed came to me through a business coach who I'd worked with and I said, no, this guy's got to tell the truth. You know, he can't be one of these fluffy people who, you know, convince you it's all going to happen overnight. And so that's why he got recommended to me, Ed, as someone with integrity, a bit of truth. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. There you Brendan, go. Brendan's laughing. He goes, Ed, integrity. <laughs> Come on, Maria. You, thinking, you've been Ed duped. Is quite fluffy. That's a good oh. way to describe you, Ed. Fluffy. Oh, I said oh. not fluff, Brendan. <laughs> you said, you said it's not fluffy. Fluffy. <laughs> I'm not fluffy at all. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I have hairy spots on me, but definitely not fluffy. Oh, so, <laughs> so look. In all, in all seriousness, which we very rarely are on this podcast, mm-hmm. is serious. Uh, I, I agree. There's a lot of bullshit about um, how do you, how quickly you can make money. And look, there is the odd occasion where that happens, but usually it involves planning, hard graft, uh, marketing, putting yourself out there, going to things, getting rejected, getting knocked back, not having successes the first time you put something out. Um, yeah. But oh, look, I. You know, I, I- I think a lot of these people as well, these overnight successes were 10 years in the making, you know, like people that pop, that seemingly pop up overnight, like the Marie Forleos or the Kim Lunas of the world, you know, or the Denise Stafford Thomases of the world. You know, these girls didn't just 
go, oh, I'm going to get a good marketing funnel and I'm going to quickly put together an online course and make hundreds of thousands of dollars per year overnight. It didn't look into all of their stories. There's a 10-year backstory to where they got, how they got to where they've gotten. And they've done a great job. Like what they're doing and the amount of money they're pulling in is huge for someone who's purely working with online sales. But there's a lot more to it. And they've all got teams behind them. It's not as if they're just sitting in their home office working four hours a week because they've read the four-hour work week and have been convinced yeah. that they can do it. You know, like there, there's, there's, there is a story behind it. So it's not meant to say that you can't do it. You can. It's not meant to say that um, it, it's impossible because it per- certainly is possible, but there's just a lot of hype and you've got to, a lot of the time you've got to sort of fight through the quagmire of stuff that's out there to get to the truth. So, yeah. Good to yeah, speak to people true. who speak the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I think four hours a week is way too long. Um, I, I think... <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm personally doing <laughs> half an hour, Ed. What do I do? Yeah, I I think Tim Ferriss time? Tim Ferriss was just you know he, he must have been working his butt off for four hours a week because I I just you know that's just ridiculous. Give me yeah. twenty minutes a day and I'll show you how to make a billion dollars. Yeah. So um, yeah, but no, it's so true. It is so true. And Brendan and I are always you know shaking our heads at various things we see or read or yeah. uh, and everybody's this, rich yeah. and nobody's working. <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that's exactly. Hilarious. And look, the old adage, if it's too good to be true, it usually is, uh, is definitely applicable in the digital marketing space. Yeah. And uh, the common thing I get uh, told when I'm talking to uh, clients who want to use this for their digital marketing uh, focus for whatever they're doing is, you know, how often they've been stung by web developers or digital marketing agencies or whoever it is. Uh, and we see it all the time. We see people get charged forty thousand dollars for a website that would maybe cost six in most most circumstances. Yeah. And you know, they they just see them coming and they just strip them of their cash. And unfortunately, um, doesn't give the industry a good reputation. Um, oh, absolutely. And it's not just in your industry, Ed. It's mine as well. I mean, I start, I see advertisements from people who do similar things to what I do, saying. Yeah, come away with me for a week. I'll charge you twelve grand, and we'll get your course written. And you know, it'll all be up. I had the, I saw one advertisement the other day from a guy promising to have the whole course written, sales funnel, everything online, ready to go in three days. It's like, what is? Are you completely off your head? Like, on what planet do you think you're going to be able to create something quality, substantial, and life changing in three days, or even a week? You know, including the sales funnel and whatever. I mean, I've been maybe I'm not the quickest um, tool in the shed, but I think I just mix my youth and Mrs. Boomer. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> yeah. No, it's taking yes. me a bit more than Proof three days. <laughs> what is it? Sharpest tool in the shed. Sharpest tool in the shed. But, but there are some tools in sheds that need to be quick. So <laughs> so you're saying right. you're a slower tool. That's I'm okay. Not, we get I'm it. Not the quickest power tool in the shed. But, um, yeah, no, it's taken me, you know, a good couple of years to get something up. And it's not even – it's still not right, you know. So I don't know. I just think, yeah, there's, it's not just your industry yet. There's, it, it's rough. And I think – if it, yeah, like you said, if it, if it looks too good to be true, there's probably a fair chance it is. And um, especially with content creation, you know, deciding that you're going to get everything done in three days down to the learning materials, the video content, the worksheets, the sales funnels, the web pages. I mean, really, you'd have to be, you'd have to be on some super heavy drugs with a team of like 30 people to get it done in that time, really. Yeah, and typically it's not that. There's maybe two or three helpers in the room, if that. Um, and yeah, and there's no way they would get the, the personal attention. So, uh, so look, often people, you know, I, I hear in this space a lot that, uh, don't, don't work for perfection to, for, until you get something out there. Good is good enough. That sort of stuff. What's your yeah. sort of thought process on that in terms of time versus quality? Like how long do you need to take before you get something out there? Um, well, <laughs> yeah, so I think when you've got something concrete like um, SEO or you, you probably just laugh when I say this, but something that's got rules around it, like if you put these words in this part and you make sure that there is a, this many number of words in this section, in this plugin, in the back end, that it will have this sort of quantifiable result. With content, it really depends on, I guess, what stage of business you're at and how quality you need it to be. I mean, I, I'm a perfectionist and it took me a long time to launch my library because I'm the sort of person that tells you that you can create a quality learning experience. So I don't want to put one out that's not quality, sort of like a hairdresser having a bad hairdo. Um, yeah. So for me, it was a little bit, I think, more point, like, more important that what I put out there was not perfect, but definitely passable. 
Um, but, you know, it depends. Yeah. If, you're, if this is the first time you're creating content um, in a group setting and you've got a smallish community of people who know you and trust you in your one-on-one sense and you want to pilot a group project, a group program, then my advice is definitely not to make it perfect. My first pilot program was on Word, like Word documents. I'm not joking. Mm. I got uh, three or four of my clients who I was working with at the moment uh, at that time and said, look, I'm thinking about putting these group learning sort of experience together because I just keep saying the same thing all the time to everybody, um, like all of my clients. And I think it would just be more efficient if I could have something I could direct you to instead. So would you mind looking at these worksheets and um, just having a quick look at these videos that I'd done up very, very quickly in my home office, you know, no lighting, no set, no nothing. Just I just wanted to get the content out um, mm. and, and to prove the idea and they all came back to me and said, oh, it's great. It was just like talking to you in a session, except I couldn't ask you questions. So I'm going to ask you now, bang, bang, bang. I was like, perfect. This is exactly what I wanted it to be. So I, I then went ahead and created the Rolls-Royce version, which took, you know, probably a good, I came to Ubud in December two years ago, and I think I had it up online, I think it was the February of next the next year that I ran the first intensive. So I think it was up online by the June or July, and then I had, a round of people go through it before I did an intensive online course and then the online version was where all the worksheets were properly branded and everything was in its right space and there was actually a community around it and weekly call times and all that sort of stuff. So yeah. from the moment I thought about doing it to this, the version that I was the happiest with was probably about 15 months and then I decided to put it all into an online library and that's only just come together now. So um, that'll be another two years later that it took to actually get it all upgraded again and then put into a library in amongst a whole heap of other courses that I've got for sale as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's not, it doesn't have to be a, a long and drawn out process, but it really depends on what stage of the process you're at. So if you're just starting out, definitely doesn't need to be perfect. In fact, it's better if you don't waste your time. Just get something up that's passable. Tell people it's a pilot. Tell people you're just testing the waters and you need as much feedback as you can because you're creating something quality and you want their feedback to help you make it as good as it could as good as it can be and then they're expecting they know they're not expecting all the pomp yeah. and ceremony so yeah. yeah that's a that's a really good point actually because i think that a lot of people who are putting content out they they do have the uh perfectionist syndrome um mm. and and then it'll never see the light of day because it's no. never going to be perfect so but no. Putting putting it out with that caveat that it's you know it is a mm-hmm. it's it's in beta version for want of a better word uh, yeah. and yeah and what you said being and, and get their input and then getting that that actually helps build the course and the material because you're getting feedback from the people who are going to be consuming it and and some of the best ideas I found come from always from the people who are going to be using the product or service so oh totally and that's like the fourth pillar in my four pillars of creating a quality learning experience is you've got to get review from your clients and then you've got to evaluate the basis of that and think right well is this is this feedback actually going to make it better or not and then you do you know that whole reflective loop making it better every time you deliver it I mean when I first did my first pilot it was hilarious I'm the content creation specialist and my clients were like Maria I think this section this whole section needs to be before this one because I haven't thought of all these questions and then I get to this and I'm like oh my god because I'm the expert I can't see the wood for the trees I do this stuff so intuitively I can't put myself in the learner chair because I'm not. I may have been the learner 20 years ago, but I'm not anymore. So that's another really good point to make. If you are a professional in your field, you may look at your content and think, oh, yeah, it definitely needs to go in this order. But unless you are doing it in that order with learners every day and you know that that is the order that they need to absorb it in, then it's really hard for you to make that call because you're not there. You're not in their mindset anymore you may have been a long time ago but now that you're the expert you're not anymore so it's really really important to pilot any materials or to beta test or you know trial or whatever the word is that you use with real clients who have the problems that you are trying to fix right right here and now okay really important cool um, so, look, in terms of content, now we're, we're using the word content and that's a very broad subject. So, and we, we, we touched on right at the beginning in the introduction that it could be a workshop or it could be some training or it could be some video courses. What, what are you finding at the moment that you're getting the most requests for? What sort of, what sort of pe- uh, work are people needing help with? 
Well, in the last couple of years, the e-course has definitely been through a surge. I personally think the e-course bubble is has burst. A lot of people come to me saying, "Oh, I want to put, I want to do an e-course because of passive income, uh, because you know, sipping pina coladas on a beach in Thailand, because yeah. you know, la la la." Sorry, not in Chiang Mai, Brendan. You know, yeah. hiking a mountain. <laughs> sorry, hiking a mountain with the hill people whilst. Um, learning yes. local embroidery skills. Is, is that more? Yeah. That, yeah. That sounds, yeah. No. sounds yeah. good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so no, courses, online courses, online training is definitely um, the highest thing that people come to me requesting. But funnily enough, I, I do myself out of a bit of work sometimes because I have, a, I have a chat with them about what they really want to deliver and what their clients really need from them. And quite often it's not an online course. Often it might be, an offering that is delivered online, but it's not necessarily an online course. An online course is something where you're facilitating it normally um, or it's up there in itself study and they can access the materials whenever they want to. Sometimes that includes video training. Sometimes it doesn't. I mean, I had one woman come to me and say, yeah, I definitely need an online course. And what we ended up doing was creating a frequently asked questions bank for her, like a, mm-hmm. a bank of resources that people could easily filter through and find. And it, it was quite clear and apparent that she didn't need video training it was actually quite technical it was like a yeah. it was a, uh, from a bookkeeping perspective so she thought that she needed to do an online course in you know the basics of bookkeeping where in actual fact what it was was people with uh, a skill set but had a lot of gaps in their knowledge and so what they were more likely to do is have one question that needed to be answered in no specific order because they had their skill sets coming from all different angles like they'd learnt their experience from maybe from working with an accountant or maybe from doing a bookkeeping course, but their knowledge and their entry points were so varied that there was no one course that was going to fit any of them. So what we just, what we ended up doing was brainstorming all the issues that they had and then lumping them together in, in areas that made sense for them to look for and then actually creating a bank of answers for them. So, yeah, it really depends. Like often, often it is an online course, but often it's not um, and there's something that suits the client better and suits you as the deliverer as well because you have to deliver that content. So if you want to put up an online course, then it either has to be suitable for 100% self-study, i.e. the person goes in, absorbs the information and then walks away and is able to immediately apply all of that knowledge or possibly with the help of other people in an online community. But then again, that's another service on top of an online course if you're offering an online community that goes with the course. So yeah, it's it's very. There's no real um, answer to that. I mean, I've just done a, I've just done a whole heap of work for the Department of Fire and Emergency Services in Western Australia, and and that ended up being short animated videos with pop quizzes at the end because they wanted to implement implement a new policy, and right. the policy is black and white, boring as you know as all policies are, but it's really important in their organisation that everyone's across the changes because it really does affect everybody. So they decided to do some, you know, some short animated videos chunking the policy down into small digestible pieces that could actually be a little bit fun instead of, you know, your good old boring training. So, yeah, we, we, we did that. It was an animated video based on a script that we created out of the policy with a bit of humour injected and, you know, a little bit of sit up and sit up and take notice sort of injected at points um, along with the video as well. So, yeah, there is no real answer to that question. It really depends on you as a person putting it together and yeah. what your clients need. Fantastic. Uh, uh, Brendan, what have you found? Because you've been developing a course and some training and stuff over the last couple of years. Um, what, what's your thought process at the moment hearing this from Maria? Well, I'm curious to hear what, what the four pillars are because it's 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 very true what we talked about at the start that it's not – there's this kind of lure that selling online courses is like free money where you're getting paid and you do nothing. But the, the point – the process of getting to that point requires a huge amount of work and I see a lot of people selling courses online that really have no business selling those courses. Mm-hmm. They have no, they're going for a money grab. You know, there's something that's in high demand online and they decide to make a course to, you know, why not? They, they make some money out of it rather than they actually have a skill set um, or something they've been offering for five or ten years and it just makes sense that... Um, you know that there's a an online format like a different you know customer mm. a different way to access it we have one service at the moment that um for some people the price point is too high and they can diy it if they if they know what to do if they're told what to do so we're about to build that into just a basic online course format but 
Yeah, I'm curious to hear what the... Tell us about the four pillars, what they are and, and how they all fit together. Thanks, Brendan. Um, yeah, it's it, it, what you say is true. There's a real distinction between curation and teaching. Curation is about putting a whole bunch of information together and going, good luck with that. <laughs> teaching, because yeah. uh, that's a library, right? Like that's sort of going, hey, here's some information. Uh, if I hope you interpret it correctly. I hope you know what to do with it. Good luck. And that's what a lot of people do. They sort of talk at you. Um, and I oh, believe you me, when I was creating this course, I did a lot of market research. So I signed up for a lot of online courses I was highly, highly disappointed with a big name out there, 1200 bucks for this course. And I got inside and it was like five PDFs and five five-minute videos, just rambling nonsense. There was no structure to it. There was no outcome. The outcome to everything was, now go away and forgive yourself. It's like, what? Like, are you serious? Like, my God, like you, you profess all these things on your sales page and then you get in there and there's just no substance whatsoever. And the yeah. substance of the course was actually getting access to a community where everybody else supports each other. So it's this highly, highly supportive group of people who sort of idol worship this woman. And that's where the value in the course is, is this online is this online group. It's like, wow, okay, so <laughs> I've just paid $1,200 to get access to a group of people who idol worship this woman. Okay, whatever. Anyway, it didn't work for me. But it's surprising <laughs> how many people do that. They put up content thinking, oh, yeah, well, I know it. So if I just blur it all out of my head and put it onto a video training or whatever, then people are going to learn from it. They're going to know what to do with it. They'll go away and their lives will change. It's not that simple. So good teaching and learning is based on the principles of best practice teaching and learning. And I distilled them after 20 years in the industry and, you know, master's of education and oh, 13 overseas postings, you know, teaching and learning in – schools and colleges and vocational colleges, uh, you know, primary school right through to adults and mature age adults. And, and the principles are all, they're, they're the same. It really doesn't matter who you're, who you're targeting. Obviously, there's different strategies for children as there are adults, but the principles apply to everybody. So the first pillar is all about connecting with who your client is and really understanding. So when you're developing your product, really understanding what is it they need and not just the outcomes, so not just, okay, they need to be able to do this, do this, do this. It's more about how do they need to learn, so really addressing their learning styles. Like do they need an online course? Do they need an interview? Do they need, you know, a series of um, books to read or articles to, to sift through? Or, you know, what is the learning style that's going to help them achieve what they need? Um, and in, in that as well, you know, really got to set expectations around the learning experience. So, you know, how long is it going to go for? How much access to me, to me that do they have? What do they need to be able to really make the most out of the course? So that when you're developing your product, there's oh, that first pillar is, is quite in-depth. Um, there is a lot of sort of, I guess, marketing 101 material in there as well. So really getting down to surveying your clients, find like needs analyses, working out what they need on a number of different levels. So not just the content but also how that, how that information is going to get delivered and so that when they're purchasing said product, they know exactly what they're getting. So they're not getting sucked in by a sales page. And when they get there, they're like, wow, okay, this is not what I was expecting. That's really important. And that's going to be your first point of contact with people. So if you're disappointing them straight off the bat, when they get in there, they see that what you promised isn't really what they get, then that's the first reason they're going to walk away from you. And that's, this is one of the big reasons why there's 3% engagement Oh, 3% completion, that was the last statistic I saw for people finishing online courses that they bought. Whoa. 3%. That's, that's crazy. That's like... It's horrific. But one three, of the major... 3%, yeah. Right? How, and think about all the time and effort you put into making these things. You, 3% of people finishing it. How many of those people are going away going, oh, wow, that guy changed my life. His stuff was amazing. I, I implemented what he did and it was just fantastic. You know, like no one, right? Yeah. So... That's your first point. If you if you want to be the, seen as the go-to expert in your field, you want to be creating quality content that actually impresses people so they go out there and go, wow, this person really changed my life. So when you're developing your product, that first pillar, connect, it's all about making sure that you over-promise, uh, sorry, under-promise, over-deliver and mm. wow people out of the ballpark. So that's really understanding who they are, what they need and how to best deliver to them. The second yeah, pillar... Yeah. Yep. It's about scaffolding good content. So when you're looking at your outcomes, making sure that they're all outcome-based, that means what am I going to be able to do? Not what am I going to learn? So not about the theories, like, oh, you're going to learn all about 
you know, X and how it will change your life. It's like bullshit. I don't want to know about that. I want to know what I'm going to be able to do at the end of it. So how it's going to change my life, that's lovely. But tell me what I'm going to be able to do. So give me an outcome. So if your course is in SEO, Brendan, what's your course in? Well, this particular course, so we have a service, the one I mentioned before. We have this service uh, where we optimize the speed of people's websites. So they have a slow website. We make it fast. So... um, Yep. So the course is basically the process we use in our service where, cause a lot of these people are technical people, so they can do it themselves if they understand yeah. the technical moving components. Um, yeah. They, they don't need, they have their own internal resources. So if we show them what we do, then they can go and do it. So great. So the overall outcome for your course then will be how to optimize the speed of your website. Yep. Get it down to yeah. one, between one and two second load times, basically. Beautiful. So that's your, that's your major outcome. So that, that's the outcome that people will get from doing the whole course. But then I'm sure there will be, you'll be breaking it down into how to reduce the size of the images, how to, I don't know, I'm sure there's 10 different yep. things that you do. Yeah, right. So as long as each of your mini lessons or modules or, you know, topics or whatever you call them, there's, there's no extent to the number of words you can use there. As long as each of them have an outcome statement that starts with how to and then a verb. So how to reduce the size of your images. How to, give me another one, uh, on the spot, Brendan. Uh, <laughs> how, how to reduce, <laughs> how to diagnose the root cause of the speed problems. Ah, beautiful. All right, so that one sounds like it probably needs to be first before yeah. you reduce the size of your images because your images might be just one of the things slowing down your course, right? Yeah, yeah. So basically there's three sections. I think one of them is foundation, like we explained the basics, and then we have a diagnosis section, and then we have – the actual how to fix it section so they can go straight from diagnosis to the particular problem and they can fix that Perfect. or they can just go through the, the steps one by one and they're ordered in the fashion that we do it and you Perfect. The most bone they get the most speed out of the first one and you know they're in priority like that so i actually Perfect. structured it like so we had an e-commerce well we have an e-commerce optimization course as well and the first version of it was it build people monthly it just information dumped onto them like it was Mm -hmm. uh, because i do a lot of e-commerce consulting so it was just a fire hose and one thing that i've learned through that process is that i totally understand i'm i used to have an it company so super technical i understand these technical concepts back to front and yeah uh, other people don't yeah i didn't realize that the for that market they just don't get the technical concepts so i need a whole bunch of stuff explaining that um and that is exactly the problem and that is exactly what the second pillar sorts out, Brendan. And this is why I love talking to people who are doing it already. You are the fire hose people with stuff like, whoa, way too much, like seriously smack me in the face with this or it's all fluff and actually getting it into a scaffolded order. So being able to systemize it out, make sure it's all outcomes based. And then like you said, if there's some sort of checklist or there's some sort of process they can go through to go okay i've done this one now i need to do this one now i need to do this one so there's a logical order to it so the second pillar is all about making sure it's outcomes based they know exactly where to go to get the result that they're looking for and b so that it's in a digestible order so it's not fire hosed so it's clumped into sections where people can you know if i said to you this is one one group of people i was uh, two girls actually had a food blogging business and they're like oh we, we can't really understand why people a bit confused on our site and I went there and there was like 48 tabs. I was like, girls, 48 tabs. I am confused. Uh, I I, I, like, I just, yeah. I don't even know where to look. Like, what? Anyway, I sifted through them and worked out that they actually had four separate areas and those 48 tabs were really easily uh, sort of chunked into four different sections. Seven is the magical yeah, number. Yeah. Any more than seven and people start wigging out, right? You've sort of got to get it down into... <laughs> two or three or four main areas that people can go, okay, I think that's where my problem can be solved. And then when they get inside, there might be a number of different steps they can choose between. But if you have this amazing amount of information that you're hoping to give people, because you know as the expert they actually need to go from A to Z, they don't want to know that. They will get completely overwhelmed and they'll give up at B or C because it's just too much. So if you can actually hone down for them and say, okay, you need to start with A, B and C and then you've got an option of going to G, H and I, or maybe S, T and U, depending on where you're at, then people are going to be able to self-navigate through that content. So the second pillar is all about putting it in the right order, making sure it's outcome to place, but then also making sure there's a system so that people can self-navigate through it or so that you can easily direct people to exactly the point that they need. And that's what I ended up having to do with my 
online library because I've got, again, 48 different lessons and it was like total fire hose. So I've broken it down into two main areas at the moment. And then within those areas, the headings, hopefully now I'm getting a bit better, but before it was still confusing people because, again, I know the information so well, but no one else does. Um, getting it into, you know, sort of scaffolded steps that make sense to the general sort of population so it's easy for them to self-navigate. So, yeah, the second pillar really is about being organised and outcomes-based. The third pillar is, these two will be much quicker, I promise. The third pillar is about um, delivery skills. So basically how you structure your presentations, how you, what visual aids you use. So visual aids could be, you know, the PowerPoints on your, on your video training or the worksheets that you're using or the instructional videos where you're taking people through a process. Um, and then also, of course, the delivery skills. So adults are really different to kids adults need to be motivated they need to be engaged that's why that three percent rate is so low because they don't like just sitting in a lecture they fall off they fall asleep they start doing their shopping list they've got to be engaged like bang 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 they've really got to be like inspired to listen and to keep listening like if I said to you for example if I told you my age and then I told you you know my marital status and how many kids I had and whatever you'd probably be in one ear and out the other but if I said to you okay have a guess, how old do you think I am? Immediately, your brain is doing something. You're immediately thinking of a number, I'm assuming, because that's human nature. When you're asked a question, your brain will go, I think this is the answer in anticipation. 27. Oh, Ed, I'm so sending you a Christmas present. Um, Was that close? <laughs> oh, Brendan, I, I tell you, give it, give it a go, Brendan, because Ed's nowhere near. I, w I was going to say the same as Ed. Oh, you're both <laughs> getting Christmas presents from me. No, okay, nowhere cool. near it, guys. Okay, so now, now you're intrigued, right? You're like, well, what is the answer? Yes, if we're wrong. What I is am. the answer? Okay, so it's a pretty simple example. I'm not. I'm so not telling you the answer until the end of the show. You're going to keep hanging on, right? Yes, no, you are. No, That's human no. nature, but it's adult learning as well. So adult learning is really different to how you teach to kids and teenagers. And the, and the trick, Brendan, which might answer your question, is why. You know, why so many people put this content online that, you know, where you get your 3% retention rate, it's because they teach the way they were taught. And the last time they were taught was in primary school or secondary school. Yeah, good point. So it's, oh, good it's about, that. yeah, it's about learning some adult, adult learning skills. And in that, that third pillar, it's all about how to elicit, how to ask questions, how to keep your audience engaged. And it's not just about how you're speaking. It's about how your visual aids are set up. And it's also about how you structure that presentation. So you've got to, yeah, there's, there's adult learning skills in that that most people don't know because, again, they haven't done an adult learning degree. But anyway, the fourth pillar is all about, like we were saying before, evaluating your material so that you can get good review feedback from your clients so that you can continually make it better again and again and again. And there's ways to get good feedback from people. There's ways to get useful, constructive feedback, not just, oh, I don't really like the colour of your clothes or I didn't really like the way you said yeah. that. There's a there's way to get timely, constructive feedback that will make your course better every time it's delivered or every time it's updated. So, yeah, they're the four pillars. Basically, connect with your people, know what they need, create a curriculum that's going to engage, inspire and motivate people to finish it, communicate with them so that they stay engaged throughout the process and then critique on a regular basis so that you've got con uh, continuous improvement. They're the four pillars. Best practice teaching and learning. It doesn't matter what you're teaching, it applies. I love it. That's awesome. This is why my darling wife Lois loves you so much, Maria. <laughs> she's she's having a, a fabulous time working with you. I got to, I got to say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and oh, and it's just, it's just the truth. You know, it's twenty years of experience. It can't be denied. You know, it's the these are the things that they work universally. I've I've taught in, uh, I think it's nine nine different countries now um, and from, you know, six-year-olds right through to, to mature-age students and the principles are the same. It doesn't matter what language, culture, country you're working in or teaching through. If you don't adhere to those principles, something's going to come unstuck. It's as simple as that. So, yeah, I love working with people like Lois because she cares. She really cares about the quality of the content and she really cares about the outcome her clients are getting. So sometimes yeah. it's not about having the right content. It's about having the right activity so that people can go away and actually implement it and implement it now. Because, again, having having good theory means nothing if you don't know what to do with it. Yes. Yeah. Reduce the size of your images. That's good. Now tell me how to do it step by step if I'm on a Mac or if I'm on a PC or if I'm on WordPress or if I'm on, you know, some yeah. other WordPress site. You know, it's important that people can apply it straight away and if they can't, that they can get support to help them. Yeah. 
good. So, yep. yeah. When so, we built the so, e-commerce course, it was interesting because we looked at all the other courses in the market and everyone was doing the fire hose and would have 40-minute long videos and it was just, Oh, no. Yeah. So, so we built it differently. It was We had three to five-minute videos to explain the what to do and why to do it and then the detail of the how was best – it's text and it's screenshots and a few Perfect. like screencast videos. But I found those even a ten minute video, it's like, well, unless it's a screencast where I'm like following along, if it's someone talking at the screen, it's just like, oh, I'm so bored now. Like it's uh, <laughs> like and, and podcasts if you want to do long form stuff, then podcasts I think and audio is much better because people don't have to be visually looking at something. They can do other things while they're listening. But it was Totally Yeah, interesting <clears throat> seeing the feedback and just, we're, I think we're on the third iteration now for the e-commerce course. So we started off. The second iteration was broke it down into weekly chunks, but even still, that's too much. Too in much. Weeks and now it's monthly. The next version yep. will be monthly. So yeah, and that just shows me that you've really connected with your market. And so in that first pillar, that product development stage, you've been through a number of iterations because you know what works and what doesn't work. You've had clients come back to you with feedback saying, like, you know, this doesn't work. And this is a great point for anyone thinking about putting content out there. I'm sure Brendan is a an expert in his field. He knows exactly what he's been talking about. He's been doing this stuff for years. But you know, I wouldn't go that far, Maria. <clears throat> well, come on, far. no. But I mean, it didn't come down in the last <laughs> hour, right? You haven't been doing this stuff for two minutes and then go, oh yes, I'm going to teach other people how to do it, right? And I taught him everything I know, Maria. I taught him everything I know. Oh, so he was he much. It was a short conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, how funny! No, but I mean, this is this is what I mean. This is the reality behind it. That even if you think you know what your clients need and want. You put it out there, you realise it's not. You realise that people can't digest it at the rate that you that you can digest it because you are the expert in the field. It's everything I was saying before. It's a beautiful example of how you go through the stages of refining your product until it suits exactly what it is your market needs. So, yeah, no, definitely it's a, it's a, it's a process that a lot of my clients go through, even with my help. They think they've nailed it and then they go out and go, oh, well, this is the feedback. Is that well? <laughs> there you go. That's what the people yeah, want. Yeah. So you need to reformat it. Simple it's, as that. It's, it's quite a big thing, really, because you, you're putting yourself out there. When you put a when you produce a course, mm. um, you know you're putting you're opening yourself up for, for for scrutiny and for people who like it and don't like it. And so a lot, this is what I think a lot of people don't put it out there because they're just yep. too too afraid to do that. And and funnily enough, that's how I mean Brendan and I first met. And I think you also know a a, a close friend of ours, Lisa Reed, because she talks about you oh, as her, well. Yeah. yeah, yeah she's um, because uh, Lisa and Brendan and I were running the Achieve More Online workshops that we started back in 2009. Mm-hmm. And um, it was it was interesting just, you know, we changed how we did them over time. But typically we would have a whole day workshop covering all sorts of subjects from search engine optimization to copywriting to photography to this. And, and people would literally leave, wouldn't they, Brendan, with their heads exploding. Like the, out. Yeah, totally stressed have, out having complete meltdowns at yeah. the information overload and it was <laughs> it's like we yeah. felt we felt bad but it was like okay how do you do how do you do all that in a day you can't really do it effectively mm. um, so you know what what do you suggest if someone wants to run a like run a day workshop and there's a lot of information how mm. would how would you do it so that people can digest it without having that sort of um, you know freak out well, you can't. This is the thing, and it's a that's a great point. It's the same as my foundations course, like my four pillars course. It used to be one course, but it was total fire hose. So I've now broken it down into four mini courses that are available separately. So product development is something you can just go in, digest, and then go yeah. away and do. Because when I did my the online course with all of those four pillars together, people were like, "Oh my god!" Like just so many questions. I need more than a week to digest what's in that to create something so that the next module, so curriculum development, that that create phase makes sense because I can't do that unless I've really let the first bit digest. So now what I do is I break it down into the 12, so in these four pillars, there's 12 steps. So I've got a really simple 12-step blueprint that skims over the top of all of them. doesn't get in-depth at all, but it skims over the top of all of them and how important they all are and it gives you a couple of questions to go away and really think about that really not very much in depth. So people can cope with that because it's not in depth at all. Or they come to me and we deep dive for two hours on product development, just one-on-one with them and their specific issues, their specific questions, person, market, you know, whatever. So 
you can't do both. You can't deliver a wide scope of information in depth quickly. It just doesn't work. You've got to, you know that, what's that old saying? You can't do anything. There's, there's sort of three points on the triangle. It's either fast, cheap, or good quality, and you can't have all three at once. Yeah. So it's the sort of the same with information when you're trying to deliver it to your clients. You either skim across the top of it or you go in depth in a short in a short amount of it. So now, like I said, with, I've either got the 12-step blueprint that really just scratches the surface of each of those 12 steps or you come with me and you go very deep into one of them um, and then you'll, you'll get those questions answered. So if you're trying to give people a lot of information really quickly, my advice is this, skim over all of it, deep dive into one. Then yeah. they get to see, oh, okay, wow, like there's this much information, I've got to come back to you. Then they go, right, I need to come back to you for the second workshop. I need to come back to you for the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh. Or they can self-select in and out of those different areas. So yeah. having like and a that's... checklist or an overview or something that summarizes the whole process so they can see the whole scope, really important. Yeah, completely agree. And so I mean, that's what we ended up changing it completely and just doing two-hour workshops rather than doing whole day ones and yep. it would just be on and it would be on one subject so it was much easier for people to digest and they didn't ha didn't have that uh, overwhelm as much some of them still did but uh, yeah. It, yeah it was it was much better so so that's uh, fantastic fantastic yeah. advice yeah whole day workshops my advice is if you're going to do a whole day workshop you need to have maybe like an hour and a half of activity of theory the rest of it needs to be activity based otherwise you're just going to lose people people cannot absorb that no. much information they've got about a 45 minute threshold with information input yep. and then after and lots that, of breaks. Unless, unless they're lots. applying it unless they're doing activities and actually using it straight away it's just it's just going to go in one ear and out the other so yeah, yeah, yeah. less but less is more i was just um a presenter in <coughs> excuse me in chiang mai not chiang mai far out brendan i'm going where you are uh in in tokyo uh and all of the presenters, one of the things we had to do was it was like 35 to 40 minutes worth of, of sort of theory presenting and then actual interactive workshopping with people mm -hmm. doing live examples, setting up accounts of this or whatever the scenario was, going through the mm -hmm. process and, and keeping people engaged. And everybody loved it. And one thing we always made sure that after every presenter there was like a 10-minute, 15-minute break for people to go off and you know, stretch and I think that's one of the things I about whole day workshops that really suck if if they don't space that out properly. As you say, there's only so much someone can retain without going nuts, and then it just it's in one ear at the other. So. Oh, totally. Look, I just did the same in summer. Where I went and they said, "Oh, you've got a forty minute keynote," and I just looked at them and went, "Well, that's not going to work." Most of these people, English is not their first language; they're going to be asleep in the first five minutes. So I made it really interactive. I asked lots of questions and and just paused and let people talk. You know, yeah, amongst themselves. I mean, you got 500 people in front of you. And then it was sad because the rest of the day was literally back-to-back 45-minute -back presentations from people delivering their research or, you know, data or whatever. And it was like, oh, my God. I mean, it was in Samoan, so I was asleep anyway. But, um, yeah, yeah, you could just feel the energy in the room. And by the end of the day, people were fidgeting. Everyone was talking. Like, oh, oh yeah. Wasn't paying any attention. It was horrific. So, yeah, break it down into, as Brendan was saying, you know, two, three minutes of, instruction yep. and then go off and do it or go off and think about it or go off and do something to bring that theory to life don't just sit on it but actually go away and implement it or go and call you know find a friend ask them try it out you do something so that it is real so that there's actually a, a, an outcome from it so there's an activity there's an application like get people doing something with it don't just fire hose them with information because yeah in one ear straight out the other so, so true. And guess whose presentation they would have remembered the most out of that whole weekend? Oh, totally. Yours. I had people coming and slapping me on the back going, please come back. We need people like you. It's like, no, what you, you, your people need is some presentation skills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bring me back and let me teach people how to create presentations like that because it's not rocket science. Again, it's about engaging adults. It's about chunking it down into tiny bits, yeah. asking loads so of true. questions, making people think. It's not about giving them the information. It's about asking questions so they can discover it themselves. And this is the thing about online learning especially and adult learning, and this is one of the, I guess one of the most important points when you are trying to make ad, uh, teach adults, is that it's about them discovering the learning, less about you telling them. 
So yeah, adults, yeah. adults want to learn, but human nature, they want to discover it themselves and then prove whether they're right or wrong. And if you can set up your learning experiences where you're going, right, what do you think the best way to do this is? Think, oh, I think it's this way. Well, you might think this, but this is actually better because blah, 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 blah. When you set it up like that, they've already got that answer in their head. It's a bit like my age, right? You just go immediately, oh, okay, she's must be over 30, she must be this, that, the other. And all of a sudden your brain is making all these connections. If I just said, this is how old I am, you're like, oh, who cares? The number goes in one ear, straight out the other. But if your yeah, brain, yep. your synapses are all sort of connecting going, ooh, I think I know the answer. I think I might not because I learned this in this place and that in that place. And your brain, or that's how your brain functions. So use true, the most true. of the adult brain, get it working, like nurture the gray matter, activate it. Don't just make it this sponge because it will – get full very quickly and then not be able to absorb anymore. So how do you uh, feel storytelling comes into education? Oh well, <laughs> <Was that? laughs> listen to this podcast of how many minutes we've been talking, like how many stories have come into it, you know? Yes. It's the basis yes. That, was a loaded, that was a loaded sort of question, but it was, you know. <laughs> totally. No, totally. And this is what one of the, you know, that keynote I did in Samoa was literally one story after another. It was, you know, one of their questions was how to motivate teachers, you know, how to motivate teachers, you know, really like seriously get me a pillow. Um, <laughs> but I, instead of like, you know, talking about, you know, behaviour management techniques and like, you know, again, I told them a story. I just, I just took them back to Kiribati, which is a, a country out in the middle of the Pacific that I lived in for two and a half years and my job was to increase English and teacher training in that country. And, and basically they said it couldn't be done. They'd told every person in my position before to go fly a kite when it comes to an English policy, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's a big, long story. But at the end of the day, their English rates increased three years' worth in six months because we introduced a policy that they had ownership over and that they knew was going to work and that actually included their culture instead of poo-hooing their culture. I mean, Seriously, you could hear a pin drop. They were all just looking at me going, what? Like, seriously, you did this and it was just in the country next door to ours? They could say, yep. But you know what? Yeah. I didn't drive it. They drove it. So give them some statistics, show them the results. You know, seriously, pin dropping. And that, you know, I could have said, so the way we motivated the students in Canada was to ask <laughs> about their culture and decide which parts of the culture were going to preclude them from speaking English on a daily basis. I mean, that's really, I could have delivered the keynote like oh, that. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I know, but instead, right? You get the shoot me now, Maria. Right? Shoot me now. So I sat down with them after they'd burnt yep. the school down, which they had, um, you know, we got there three days later, the college oh, burnt down. Really? Anyway, oh, sorry, the college burnt down. They didn't burn it down. The college burnt down. So we're sitting underneath the coconut trees and we're going, right, so how are we going to get English speaking? And I was like, really, does anyone care? You know, and that's, that's the way you get this message across. And, you know, they're all just like, wow, coming up the back, slap on the back, like, gee, please come back. We need trainers like you. So, yeah, yes. storytelling is huge. It's And fun, which right? is critical. You've got to have fun. I firmly believe if you inject humour and fun, it connects the the – the, the thought process and learning much more effectively, in my humble opinion, and from stuff I've read as well. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. Not always. Any Anytime I do a presentation, I always start off with a story. I tell people my Oprah Winfrey story and how she purchased products from me and various things like that. And it gets, there's a whole, I won't go into the story now, but it gets, but you can just see people going, oh, yeah, Oprah Winfrey, what's this? And then I tell the whole story. And I never say hi. I'm Ed from Online Impact. <laughs> and I've been in the digital marketing space for 14 years. <laughs> yeah, Maria. I think, so, I think after the call, I'm going to go shopping. I think I need some. What did yeah, I think I needed? I need some yeah, bananas. And, God, I'm yeah. sure I've got an ingrown hair on my leg. <laughs> um, right? <laughs> yeah, anything. <laughs> anything but. So um, that's fantastic. Well, look, we have been having a fantastic conversation for the last 50 minutes, believe it or not. Oh my God! See, um, so we're having fun. So we're we're getting close to finishing. So, uh, Brendan, is there anything else you would like to uh, ask Maria while we've got her on the call? Not anything I think off the top of my head. Anything we should ask you, Maria? <laughs> well, I think it's been a. I, I think it's been a real. What? Uh, maybe how old I am? No, and I'm still not telling you. Um, you no, see? keep keep that as keep that a secret. Keep that. Yeah, a well, well, you know, old ladies. Mm-hmm. Um, That's it. No, uh, no. I, I think it's been a really good conversation. I think the key messages around creating content, especially if it's online content, is to know who your market is, to understand, you know, your people, 
understand what they need and want, and then create something in sizable chunks that they can digest. And when you create them, create them with adult learning strategies in place so that you're guiding the learning process, not shoving information in their face. And I think when you do that and when you continually get feedback so that you can improve your process, you are going to improve. And I guess for a lot of people, the understanding with a lot of the marketing that they see online is that it happens overnight, that it's a really quick process. I think people need to think about whether they're trying to make a quick buck or whether they're leaving a legacy behind, you know, whether they're leaving yeah. information that's going to um, sort of define them as the go-to expert in their niche. And if that's what you want, if you want to define yourself as the expert in your niche, if you want to be known for quality online or offline training that makes a difference, then it takes time there's no quick fix you can't have fast uh cheap uh fast cheap and quality in one you've got to choose two you know like you want it fast and you want quality then it's going to cost you money because you're going to need to outsource a lot of it you want it fast and uh fast and cheap then you're going to have to you know sort of bit of a dip on quality it's just that those three cannot happen at once you either need to Yeah, they can't occupy in the same space, that's true. They, they, they just can't. And I guess it's what you want to leave as the legacy. So if you want to do something quick and dirty to make a quick buck, then do it. But that's the reputation you'll end up with for sure. So Yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm not sure. So what need. how do people get in contact with you? What's the, the best way? Go to your website, what's your email, etc. Beautiful. We'll, put, yeah, my, we'll put this in the show notes as well. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, it's mariadoyle.com, just my name.com. Um, on the homepage there, there's a, um, a content creation checklist. So if you really want to understand the process I go through with people, it's like a 30, it's about 38 different steps in there. But um, And again, it's because the, the content creation process is not like, oh, have an idea, get it online. Like There's a lot of different steps in between there that you need to think about. And if you think about them before you start, the process is going to be much more efficient and much more course, effective. Yeah. So, yeah, if you download that checklist, it's free, of course. And then it takes you through all the different lessons that I do have in my online library. So if you want to DIY, you can go and do them that way or you can just give me a call. I'm happy to have a 15-minute chat with anyone about their situation and help guide them on what it is they need. But if you've done that content creation checklist first, then you will have been able to self-select quite a bit of what it is that you need. And then I'm more than happy to have a chat through with you and talk about, you know, your different options or what you and your clients need or what you and your market really need. That's, that's normally how I start off with people is just a quick chat to you know, see where they're at. But, yeah, it's a much more efficient process if you can do that content creation checklist first so you know where you're at and then I know exactly how to help you. Great. Good advice. Thank you very much for that. So uh, we'll let you get back to your, uh, I was going to say relaxing, but I don't know, you, you probably you working working yourself silly right now, are you? You've got lots of, lots of stuff on by the sounds of it. So, yeah, um, I do. And my Ubud is my second home in Bali, but uh, I come up here to get work done and to be looked after. I've got uh, got a team of people looking after me, so I don't have to do the the sort of drudgery that you do at home. You're cooking and you're cleaning and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I can't don't know. I just get, know it. Get a lot, get a lot of work done. That's what I. That's why I'm up here. So yeah, I better go off and actually get some done. <laughs> yeah, and look, I'm telling you, I'm telling you now, if you can somehow solve the mosquito issue. Um, you know, just completely eradicate them. Lois will be there in a heartbeat because that's the only thing that puts her off about going to places is mosquitoes love her. She's like, I can stand next to her and they'll all be on her and not on me. They just love her blood. Well, that's why people take me to barbecues, Ed. Oh, so you're the you're the human repellent. Yes, yes, Uh, I am. No, no. So I don't, yeah, don't, oh, I might have to have a word in Lois's ear. Yeah, always safe with me because the mosquitoes find me. They gravitate towards me and don't leave me alone. So, no, she doesn't need, uh, there's there's no problem up here. I might just have to have a quick word in her ear. Yes, have a quick word in your ear. Yeah, I I think, I think it's on the cards. I think, um, you you could cope without her for, for a week. Well, one might even come myself, but <laughs> that's not the point, Ed. No, you. Oh, didn't. sorry, isn't it? It's just for a bit of girl time. Okay, all right. Damn, <laughs> subtle. I missed that subtle. <laughs> all right. What's okay. funny? I'll be fine. I'll cope. At least, at least I know I'll be fed because I always feed myself, and that's I'll the main. Be, well, there you go. Well, maybe you can. All go right. Well, we've got boy time with Brendan in Chiang Mai. There you go. We so have. I have. I've been. I've been to Chiang Mai a few times, and Brendan and I have hung out, haven't we, buddy? <laughs> we have indeed. 
I think one time we, you were here, I left. So yeah, well, you were leaving the next day. You were, you were, We just had a bit of a crossover because you knew I was coming, so you had to make sure you, you were leaving. Clear, so, out. clear yeah. out, clear out, Ed's oh, coming. Sh- that bloody Ed, he's a prick. He's coming. <laughs> I just can't handle it. Um, so thank you again for being on the the show, Maria. Greatly no appreciated it. Uh, what you said was fantastic. Hopefully people will get in touch with you and um, start implementing and getting some of their content and great stuff they've got in their head out into the world because if if it's in your head, it ain't doing nobody any good any at good. all. Any good. Absolutely. So get it out. Get it on. This is why we do the podcast. And one of the reasons we do the podcast is we keep getting asked the same sort of things all the time. So we thought, well, let's do a podcast that answers all these questions about X, Y, Z. Yep. And uh, we can just point our clients that go and listen to this podcast. And it's been very useful for that reason. So um, uh, coming up next week, we've got one of our friends on uh, that you know, John Blake. Oh, John's awesome. Yeah, John is awesome. We're talking about his sales breakthrough strategy um, mm-hmm. because John is the man when it comes to, to sales and sales processes. And uh, we look forward to having him on in the next episode. So yeah. Um, Definitely. So, if you're going to create something, make sure you know how you're going to sell it because that's not a problem a lot of my clients have. Like, I've got this thing. Now, what do I do yeah. with it? It's like, yeah, good question. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you go and talk to someone who knows what to do in sales online yeah. or offline. His yeah, strategies exactly. don't waste your time. This is too true. So that'll be great. So uh, awesome. enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for your time and we'll speak to you soon. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. See ya. See ya. You've been listening to The Business Marketing Show. You can find us at businessmarketingshow.com on iTunes, SoundCloud and Stitcher.